Welcome to a lecture on brick as part of a series of lectures on masonry, stone, and concrete. My name is Joseph T. Wonderich. Brick has advantages and disadvantages. As we know, buildings and building components have fire ratings and the fire resistance of brick can be very advantageous, especially in locations where there are forest fires at, uh, in the West now in California. Uh, you want your exterior shell to be as fireproof as possible. Sound absorption is also a great advantage. Uh, you know this from living in the dormitories or in, uh, hotels. Uh, you can have brick between units of uh, condominiums or some kind of uh, surface or uh, material with, with mass, absorbs the low frequencies better than uh, other materials. Uh, and if you have street noise, if you're in the city, uh, you need uh, noise reduction and, uh, to, to reduce the sound transmission coefficient of the materials of the wall section. Uh, brick is also low maintenance it uh, over time could get mold on it uh, you may need to acid wash it but that's usually over a very long time period compared to other materials that may need painting or other kinds of maintenance the disadvantages uh, it's a time to construct uh, you have to mix the mortar and you have to set up uh, string lines and uh, Keep it plumb and level and you know, straight line with the, the courses and you need somebody with some skill to do it quickly and uh, it takes usually on average much longer than other kinds of uh, veneers on buildings. Uh, skilled labor costs, you're going to pay more per hour for people that know what they're doing. and. Uh, over, over the century, there's many less skilled laborers uh, as masons as there was earlier. Uh, when we had many immigrants who came in, a uh, large percentage from Italy who knew very much about masonry. Uh, also structurally unstable and seismic zones. So it's tricky to reinforce brick uh, you can't really reinforce the individual bricks. You have to make a wall section with some kind of uh, either cast concrete or other material with some kind of reinforcing in a cavity space or uh, not a cavity space, but in a space between. Uh, if you have brick on two sides or as a veneer, you need some kind of reinforced uh, structure uh, to as a, a shear wall or a cavity work as a structural diaphragm to take the lateral loads of uh, seismic loads and the oscillations and so uh, brick is really not uh, suitable for structural purposes and even as a veneer uh, it can tend to come off and fall and, and injure people uh, as happened in uh, you'll see earlier modules, uh, earlier, le er, earlier lecture on structural failures. Uh, if you go back and look at that, there's some slides on that uh, from San Francisco where some facades fell off in the 1989 uh, Loma Linda earthquake in uh, uh, the region where they actually filled in from the 1906 earthquake they filled in debris into the uh, bay and then built on top of it and so that soil was unstable uh, subsurface conditions unstable actually uh, had liquefaction where the soil behaves like a liquid and vibrated some of those buildings and uh, what's believed called the tenderloin area uh, and uh, brick facades fell off Brick properties are 
Uh, the modern brick, as we mentioned, is usually extruded. So this is the, uh, the process here of uh, getting it out of the ground, transporting it at the beginning, uh, then uh, proportioning, getting it uh, mixed up in uh, somewhat unif uniform, and, and then getting it, uh, uh, rolling it out, mixing it, and then the extruder, uh, which squeezes it out in a long section, and then you chop off uh, the extruded section into pieces and then drying uh, and then firing and then packaging and, uh, or uh, transporting to the site. Some modern brick manufacturing by extrusion um, images. So here's the first one compressing during extrusion, removing air pockets that can cause fracturing and then uh, down the end here this is uh, a robot you'll see um, <clears throat> continuous extrusion and cutting uh, line feeds uh, two separate robots in this particular example so please uh, uh, click on the manufacturing link you see at the top of the page there and watch that short video i will keep talking in this video just pause this uh, uh, video and, uh, and click on that link um, and uh, there's an extrusion machine you can see examples of the different shapes that are extruded the ones on the bottom right are uh, not typical kinds of ones you use in the United States but you see them in, uh, see them in Europe uh, and in Japan and you can extrude longer shapes uh, or do things like you'd see in the, in the, in the middle of these set of, uh, of uh, examples at the bottom more typical in the United States uh, brick bonds uh, actually this one should be uh, titled brick types uh, but we're going to show uh, bonds coming up um, uh, perhaps I'll fix that in this before you look at this lecture but it says brick bonds there it should say brick types uh, this is a, a stretcher soldier header uh, oh I apologize this is the orientation so yes this would actually apply to bonds <clears throat> um, the, the bond is is the way uh, you lay them out so uh, in, in a sequence and so if you have stretchers they're uh, just going along the front face I'll show you in a second soldiers are standing straight up headers uh, the next slide I'll show this a little more clearly uh, but the bond is made based on the orientations and how you sequence all of them so this helps to make this clear <coughs> so um, your orientations uh, a header is more of a structural connected kind of uh, piece typically uh, often these days we'll see in a wall section you just have one layer of brick and it is connected with uh, metal fasteners hangers to a, uh, a wall behind <coughs> and this what you see here is what was traditionally done where the brick would be uh, the entire wall inside and outside and you would plaster or paint the inside uh, but now we have a separate wall on the, on the inside for a number of reasons um, including uh, ease of uh, finishing with drywall and paint and, and also more importantly um, putting your um, electrical and uh, added insulation into the walls where you need some space to, to do that so you, as you can imagine you can't do that very well inside of a purely brick wall uh, the soldier face uh, is mostly an aesthetic kind of thing to do um, uh, that in, in that kind of uh, brick uh, orientation for the bonds 
a brick mortar type joints, mortar type joints. And here is a, a tool uh, that you use for the, the concave, which is the most typical surface for both brick and concrete block, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. You also have other kinds of uh, things you can do, uh, depending on how you tool it. And this is where somebody with some experience comes in also. Uh, not just getting everything flush, you know, and the wall plumb level, and everything straight with even dimensions, you know, even thickness between each mortar joint, but also how you finish the uh, tooling is an artisan trained uh, artisan, skilled labor kind of thing, and you're going to pay a little extra to get that done, right? Otherwise, it take you a lot longer and you potentially get a messy job, too. Brick mortar pointing, so um, <clears throat> if you uh, need to fix your brick uh, many years later when uh, the mortar joint uh, can potentially crumble and break away many, many years later. Uh, you can repoint, you, know, you, can, you can come and saw, saw out, chisel out, if you, uh, typically it's a saw, it's sawed out or a special tool for it, grind out uh, quickly uh, a fixed depth into the mortar, not too deep, and to stabilize the whole wall, but just enough to uh, make a gap in what looks like a raked mortar joint, and then you come back and fill in with something uh, else, some other kind of uh, new joint. Mainly to fix the mortar that put, had presumably crumbled away. Brick mortar strengths by type. So curing is a special process for all um, cementitious uh, you know, mortars, uh, uh, brick mortars, also uh, uh, concrete, when we get to the whole lecture on concrete and reinforced concrete, curing is the critical stage where you need to keep the moisture in and to control uh, the heat somewhat also, we want to keep the heat in, I could tell you stories about that, where uh, uh, especially in uh, buildings in Texas that I've uh, been involved with where you uh, put hay bales on or other materials to keep uh, uh, concrete uh, curing. Um, one example, well, we'll give other examples that reinforce concrete. Uh, I can tell you about on high rises, uh, huge columns that get uh, very, very hot inside as they're curing, and you want to keep all that in. Uh, it's actually a tube structure that. Uh, huge columns on the outside of a high-rise uh, in Dallas. Uh, but maybe we'll talk about that a little more later. Uh, now we're talking about brick, and this is the, uh, the mortar between the bricks holding everything together. And there are types here and varying strengths. You would use on different applications depending on the load that you're holding up. Uh, I, that, as you imagine, brick is very good for load bearing has high compression strength and the mortar should have high compression strength uh, too. So the whole composite structure of mortar and brick is, uh, is equally strong. Uh, and you can see the different, I uh, won't read through all these, but you can see the different usage. So, you know, if you're uh, um, doing something with uh, a need for much less compressed strength, maybe just putting bricks on the ground as uh, for, for pavers on you know, a patio. Uh, that's uh, that's different than if you're uh, holding up quite a bit of strength where the uh, historic preservation down the bottom, uh, you need to hold up the whole building with a brick wall. Cornices now, so we're learning you know the architectural terms as well as uh, all the properties and materials and methods. And so these are uh, different, uh, more historic. People still do these nowadays too. 
you can get trained people to do it, you can see the different ways you might make a cornice. Uh, it's coming back a little bit in fashion now that this was very much the way to do the top of the building and the, the uh, details for aesthetics long ago, which was a nice custom in the United States and elsewhere. Your cornices, sills, uh, as you imagined, anytime you have a surface like this that can uh, catch water, uh, rain, uh, you need to have a, a special way that you construct it. Um, this is more of a, a method uh, than a material, but there are also, as you can see here, uh, materials available. I believe these are European pictures, most likely they look like, yes. Um, you can do it with a more standardized brick also, uh, but it's a very good idea to, to slope slope the uh, sill outwards so the rain sheds off. However, you can buy special molded bricks which have a taper to them to allow the water to shed. Lintos are uh, above uh, a form of a, a header, but a brick lintel is, uh, is structural. Um, typically in the past, like you see in the bottom left corner here, but in, in these ones on the right, they're more aesthetic and you can see there's a structure behind, uh, either in the, the bottom two on the right, uh, oh, did I say on the left? Uh, the, the one on the bottom left is the old version where it's uh, structural itself. Um, actually, everything on the left is more uh, structural uh, and aesthetic. On the right, it's more of a, a facade uh, or even more of a facade. It's just a, a surface veneer with structure on the, uh, on the right behind. So it's not actually technically a, a brick. It's just a faux brick, but it allows you to blend in with the other uh, real bricks you can see in the pictures. Uh, so this is just some methods of uh, finishing your windows details. A coping is what you're going to put on the top of the wall. Uh, some nice detail at the bottom here. You can see how to do that. And some special shapes, special molded shapes or extruded uh, that you put on the top. Uh, again, just shed water, but also for the aesthetics of it. Uh, here's a photo of uh, me in uh, Mons, Belgium in 2014. And you can get a feel for the uh, artisanship of the, of the brickwork. Uh, if you can imagine doing that, including the, the arch in the back, arches. Uh, and, uh, this is not fast work, although you know, much faster with a skilled laborer, but still uh, this is not something you're going to crank out very quickly. In this picture you see a uh, spiral shape. Uh, this is in Kyoto, Japan in 2000, 2013. Uh, with my son. Uh, we were in uh, uh, Osaka for a conference and then uh, Kyoto, we're also in Narita. Um, <clears throat> you can imagine the difficulty in making something like this. I uh, will see in a later slide where this was certainly done, uh, or, uh, some, a pattern like this, similar, was done in the dome in uh, Florence, Italy, for structural reasons. During the Renaissance, I'm not sure the date of this, this is not during the Renaissance, there's a, a railroad bridge above, or a railroad track above, uh, but nevertheless you can see the, uh, the level of detail here and imagine the craftsmanship it takes to make such a thing. Uh, this is an earlier picture from Italy in 2004 in uh, uh, Portofino. Uh, that's along the, uh, what's considered the Italian Riviera between uh, Genoa and Genova and Italiano uh, down to uh, Cinque Terre, the five towns uh, along 
on that coastline. It's absolutely beautiful. And this is uh, uh, on, the, on the left side of this photo, you see the brick and the steps, but they also mixed in some uh, uh, loose stone uh, kind of detail. And then uh, a cut stone uh, kick you know, at the edge of the uh, steps. Uh, this is closer to home in 2006. This is uh, Cabrini College near uh, outside Philadelphia, western suburbs of Philadelphia. Uh, that's actually my mother and daughter in the picture. Um, this was an old mansion, old estates of uh, wealthy Philadelphia main line. Uh, I don't think people rarely can afford this size estate anywhere now. These, uh, these had stables and a carriage house and a staff of dozens of people. Uh, it's now a college as many of these old estates uh, were converted uh, mid, mid 20th century uh, into some other use. These are brick pavers. Uh, this is uh, now a little more recent again in uh, Florence. Uh, Italy, Florenzi, Italia, Brunelleschi, there's a whole story of the dome, uh, there's the engineering as well as the politics and the social context of the whole uh, uh, the competitive nature of the different parts of Italy and who would have something first. Uh, they, they actually didn't know how to build this dome when they first built, they built everything up to the rim of the dome and then they uh, we're still trying to figure out how to build such a big dome. It's a large span, a uh, great deal of weight, and Brunelleschi came up with a way uh, simulating uh, uh, how the structure of an egg works. Uh, you can see a picture, uh, I believe my son took this picture in the bottom right. I took both of these pictures, actually, uh, and the uh, one in the bottom right is a herringbone pattern that uh, spirals down inside the dome and that uh, transfers the loads uh, down to the rim from, uh, from above, uh, uniformly distributing it uh, in, a, in a structural way. So uh, this is not uh, an aesthetic kind of thing. It's actually hidden inside the structure. You gotta walk inside these hallways in the dome to see it. Uh, now here's the bonds that I mentioned before. It has to do with the orientation. So uh, these are all stretcher orientations because they're all stretched out. Um, uh, well, actually, there's other orientation in here too. But you see the different ways you can do it. Now, typically, you want your mortar joints not to line up uh, in the stack. Uh, the stack bond that you see uh, for structural reasons, because then you have uh, one uh, area for a potential stress concentration. Um, so you want to be careful with that. But you can do it as for veneer, it's perfectly fine. But if, you, if it's carrying a large load, uh, load bearing wall, it's better to stagger your joints. This is more recently in uh, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Oak Park is a suburb of Chicago uh, with quite a few Frank Lloyd Wright uh, works of art and architecture. Um, I made a video lecture, video log of 31 sites in and around Chicago. And this is one very close to his home and studio where he uh, had six children and his, uh, his own firm that he started up after leaving uh, Adler and Sullivan. Uh, Louis Sullivan was his mentor. Uh, and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright worked in, uh, in that firm. Uh, as a high-rise specialty uh, that firm was. And Louis, or, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright got to do the residential part uh, that became his job after he uh, worked his way up very quickly because of his skills. This particular house here is uh, the Hurtley residence and uh, the brickwork here, uh, the bond you see uh, is accentuating the horizontality uh, that he's known for in his prairie style and uh, 
his organic design of, uh, of complementing the site and the environment. This is the, the Midwest and the open plains, and so the horizontality is emphasized. And uh, you can click on the video lecture here and go to Time Index 2730 and watch uh, that video. Uh, of course, this one, one of uh, one of the sites in the video. You're welcome to watch the whole thing if you like, and come back if, uh, uh, unless we're doing this in class as part of a Zoom, and then we'll just look at it very quickly. Uh, but presumably, some of you might do this on your own later or beforehand, and you're welcome to watch the video lecture and come back. Just come back to the PowerPoint, uh, and it should uh, resume where you left off once you've clicked on the link and gone and the web browser opens and plays it. And now here's another uh, thing at time index 47.16 in the same video. And this is uh, the Roby House on the campus of the University of Chicago. Um, he didn't have many buildings down here. Uh, this is a different part of Chicago on the south side. Uh, on a very nice part of the south side, uh, of, uh, which, which is not typically the nicest part of Chicago, but this is the uh, University of Chicago campus is certainly beautiful. This is right on the University of Chicago campus. So please uh, go in there and uh, take a minute to look at that. And you can see uh, the uh, brick facade here. Now these are Roman bricks, um, which we'll uh, talk about a little in a, a little bit the uh, uh, or have actually talked about in the past uh, in previous lectures the uh, the Roman brick which is a longer uh, thinner brick and a lot more mortar a lot trickier to make look uh, nice and straight um, <clears throat> this is uh, now back in the United States on the Philadelphia Main Line again, an old estate that was converted into uh, St. Aloysius Academy, uh, K through, I believe they start kindergarten, but I know they go through high school, or I believe they, they used to uh, when I went to school in this area uh, long ago. Uh, but it is a school, not a college. This one's a, a school, a secondary school. And you can see the brick there. And my son on the porch. Um, some of the, the details. The brick facade, the veneer. Now here is a uh, working drawing type detail. Well, this one's not particularly a working drawing because there's no dimensions. But this, this would be an architectural detail, uh, which is nicely color coded. And you can see uh, this is a residential construction. So uh, I would like people to be able to recognize if it's commercial versus residential. And typically the difference is going to be the structure of uh, wood versus steel in the United States. And of course this varies some uh, even within the United States, but typically uh, and worldwide it's certainly differently different also, but typically you're going to see wood uh, frame construction. We had several, we had three lectures on that earlier. You can go back and look at uh, and um, you can see the, the standard symbols for wood. So when you see a, uh, an X on a piece of wood, that means you're cutting through it. And then that's the symbol for looking at a cut section. So you're looking at the bottom, the, uh, at the, the very first one that's pointed to at the top is the bottom plate of the interior wall of a stud wall. And then uh, the second one that's going across, that's plywood, that's symbol for plywood or uh, actually wood flooring on top of a subfloor of plywood and there's two things right there in that w w floor section and then the, th the uh, below that um, you see this the structure the, the floor joists coming across and then uh, a bearing plate bearing that load uh, and tied down with an anchor bolt into the uh, structure below and then the brick, uh, you see some details of the brick veneer. Uh, you see a point to a corrugated metal tie. Uh, it doesn't have to be corrugated, but um, it's just one way of doing it. It's uh, nailed into the structure uh, 
behind, which is a stud wall here in this case with some uh, insulation, the blue, um, or this, they say it showed as sheathing there, but it's actually uh, looks like a polystyrene kind of insulation. Uh, you can call that sheathing. Uh, typically, the sheathing is a very outer layer, but that, that's the sheathing on the interior wall. And then you have a wall cavity in between the space, and that's uh, for ventilation as well as moisture that does get in. Let it kind of drip down. You'll see at the very bottom uh, near the finished grade there a weep hole. That's a drilled hole to let the water come out. Um, and so the air space, the air gap is, uh, is, is for, uh, as we mentioned, and then there's flashing. Anytime you have water that you're shedding off, even inside the building, you got to get it out. So uh, they see the flashing is a, uh, looking at a, a section through it. It's a long piece of metal that's behind the wall, nailed to the uh, structure behind, and then bends and goes between a, mic a brick course and comes out. And that should be continuous, um, as for obvious reasons, if you have moisture, you're trying to shed away from the building. And then the finished grade, that's the symbol for dirt uh, that you see there. You should become familiar with these symbols. This is the same kind of uh, brick veneer, but now... Uh, this was a nice trip. We had a family trip, also a business trip where uh, half the time uh, my wife and daughter with with us my son and then my son and i stayed and we uh, went to 31 different frank lloyd wright sites over four and a half days in and around chicago made the, the video uh, much of the video lecture some of it was done with my wife and daughter around uh, this one was done with them and this is actually a house built by uh, my wife's father and his father uh, where they got these Roman bricks actually for free on a, donated by a local um, building supply, a lumber yard, a masonry supply yard, uh, because people didn't want them. It's so labor intensive. And this stack bond is per perfectly appropriate, not holding up a, uh, uh, floors above. Uh, and uh, I imagine that was very labor intensive, or I actually have heard that it was from my father-in-law that he built this himself. Um, this chimney, and this is very much uh, uh, in the style that, as you would imagine, is influenced by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designs and others uh, for using Roman brick at the time. Uh, horizontality is very much a Midwestern uh, nomenclature or uh, vernacular. Vernacular. Uh, we won't go through all the details here, but this is commercial construction, and you can see uh, this is you know, a little more than you would see in a, if, to give your general contractor to you know, to bid on and to build from. This is more of uh, maybe a marketing kind of, uh, of detail, but this is very informative if you do a three-dimensional section like this. In color uh, with a legend makes it pretty clear. And, and this, what you see, that capstone of uh, cut stone is how I am imagining most walls should look. I just wouldn't show that in section like they did on that previous section. Perhaps that's what they were thinking about, but they showed it layered. That typically this is going to be one, uh, one uh, uh, uniform homogeneous material uh, for, for shedding water and you know, already surfaced because it's masonry. This, this, this is a typical uh, detail. This would be a, a, called a parapet wall, the little wall that goes around the top of the uh, around the roof area. Uh, and this is uh, a, a very common way of detailing it, and an appropriate way too. Um, some interesting things to point out, maybe looking at the, that little circle in the top above, you'll see uh, uh, if there's a saw cut underneath. And so when we talk about shedding water, uh, you want it, uh, water because of surface tension when it runs over the edge and down the side it'll come come back in horizontally underneath and work its way into the building so you put you cut that that you make that channel cut so that it drips off it stops the flow of water it 
the water will be coming around and underneath it and it'll fall off right there. The little details like that can give you a hint of craftsmanship and people thinking about what's going on, not just aesthetically, but also the function of the building. Uh, equally important things, but you want both out of your uh, contractor and your architect specifying. Now, chimney details. Chimneys are freestanding structures. Uh, this is a residential construction model, and you'll see uh, there's a flue, starting from the top, a clay flue liner. So that needs to be uh, you know, a continuous thing with uh, fireproof uh, mortar that you, you don't want the fire and smoke getting out of the flue into the cavity and then potentially into the brick and into the house and burn up the house. Uh, uh, then again, here's a pre, uh, precast or cast in place with a drip. Well, that drip would be the saw cut of a uh, uh, chimney uh, cap, and uh, uh, that really needs to be carefully put in place, uh, especially if you're going to be cutting it yourself on the job site. You really need trained artisans to do that right. Uh, it's not the roofer's job up here. This is all uh, the mason doing this, because again, it's built as a freestanding structure. Now, the mason may cut in the flashing that you see down below. Actually, they'll need to, uh, that metal that metal you see wrapped around like an apron on the bottom, uh, the roofer will come in and saw cut uh, into the mortar after the chimney's already up, and then uh, uh, a special saw blade. You can't just use your carpentry saw. Typically, you need a masonry saw bit or saw saw blade, uh, circular saw, and uh, with fine diamond uh, crust, diamond uh, dust, to cut through stone. Uh, or and there's other ways of doing it too, but that's you know, want blades that last longer. The diamond, they're, they're very expensive. Uh, it's just diamond dust, but still, it's harder than anything else to cut through. Uh, so again, back to the masonry. From starting from the top, you see the cap. Um, they're telling you you need a two-inch minimum overhang. That's for shedding water, even with the drip. Uh, the uh, even with the uh, drip cut in below. And then you see a, um, the next one going down says uh, uh, backer rod and sealant between flue and cap. Yep, as you can imagine, a lot of water could work its way in there. And, uh, behind the wall and into the house. Um, and then flashing, you see the detail of that. And that's not a trivial thing to do right. Uh, either manufacturing it or installation of it. And then uh, counter flashing, uh, flashing and counter flashing. We'll, we'll talk about the difference between flashing and counter flashing. We get to waterproofing. Typically, you put flashing and counter flashing together in a composite waterproofing kind of uh, continuous construction detail. And here's uh, the brick chimney from. Um, uh, interior kind of view and section, uh, three-dimensional section. So starting from the top, you'll see chimney. There's the flue liner, uh, brick infill. Now this can be a different kind of fire brick, special fire brick. Uh, you can build the whole thing out of fire brick, but they're, they're showing different kind of brick here, uh, which is not a, a bad idea to do. Uh, parge brick at smoke chamber. Parge is a, is a coating. Uh, that you, you roll or paint on, uh, uh, which uh, makes it more so that the smoke can't get out. A damper is the mechanical control where you open that you open and shut to let the, the airflow <coughs> to get a draw, to get air draw to go in and up the chimney so the smoke doesn't fill the house. Uh, Smoke chamber, smoke shelf, uh, fire back, uh, brick, special brick in the actual fire chamber. Uh, there's all kinds of bricks, so you can look up the details of what to use where. Lots of variation. Um, fresh air intake, so there's a way to, to bring air in to draw in from the outside to get a nice draw. Uh, typically in the old, older houses, you're just using the draw of the from inside of the house, but if you're not careful and you make your house too airtight when you renovate it, then you can lose some of the draw. 
So uh, frequently now is a detail. Uh, sometimes in the codes, so you're going to see this where you need to get that exterior draw coming right from uh, the outside air, as you see there. And that, that detail warrants even more. And other details just for that, uh, you might want to make for the uh, contractor. An ash pit. Uh, collect burned up uh, ashes. Uh, you could have that actually go down into the basement, is what it used to do, which is the hole that goes in. You collect the ash in the basement. Uh, different ways of doing that. And the foundation that coming on the inside. Uh, you see uh, a fire stop insulation. You have to be very careful of not letting that heat of smoke even get to the house itself. It could easily have a house fire if you don't c construct this correctly. You don't want to just hire just any old person to build a chimney for you. They should be trained with lots of experience of how to do this correctly. And the codes are very strict about this also. Now the mantle shelf is a, more of an architectural thing, how you make your mantle. Uh, steel angle support, corbelled brick infill. Corbeling is the way when you when you make the brick face come out differently. You can do that for architectural reasons uh, or structural. And this is a support. The steel angle iron is a structural support. Uh, the face, of course, is just the face. And the opening and the lintel, like we already spoke about, going across. That is structural here, although you may want to have a piece of angle iron uh, there. Oh yeah, well they do. They, they're pointing at the, the brick, the soldier bricks, the oriented bricks up and down. It's not, that alone is certainly not going to hold up the structure. Uh, what you see there is the lintel. That, it's hard to kind of see it there, but that looks like an angle iron, uh, an L-shaped extruded steel structural piece that goes across and then into the sides so it can have some bearing, load bearing. Uh, and you probably, well, so you don't have to detail every bit of this. If you get an experienced mason, uh, you even have less detail than this. Certainly don't give everybody a three-dimensional thing, but uh, you know, a mason will just know how to do that, right? You don't have to get exhausted with the details. Uh, if you're not trusting the contractors, then yes, you do. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a judgment call. You can spend a lot of time trying to do every single detail to tell each trade how to do their work right. Uh, sometimes you have to, but uh, you have to make that judgment call how much detail you want in the working drawings, uh, which come after the architectural drawings. And normally very much more detailed. There's a hearth now at the very bottom of a hearth is to catch, as you imagine, uh, it should be fireproof, needs to come into the room, and the codes do d specify this specifically, how the dimensions of this, how far it needs to come out. Uh, of course, it has to be fireproof. So, uh, as you would imagine, the fire can pop or just fall out into the room. You don't want it falling out on carpeting or something flammable. Uh, here is a brick chimney corbeling. Uh, this is architectural, aesthetic. Again, people used to, and still to this day, uh, times, you're going to pay for it, though, and you need the skilled labor to, to really do this quality of uh, work. It's not a trivial thing to get that looking right a water table brick so a water table there's different it's synonymous I mean there's synonym water table also means the water ground water level below um, you know, of, the, of the ground but then this this that's not the definition here this is the level for uh, or it, it's, it's inferred by that has to do with the water shutting down the building and this particular brick is, uh, is, is is bumped out here as a detail. The whole the whole everything below is bumped out, and so the top course, the top bond, is a, and this one's molded especially for it. This particular one is a water table brick. You can do this with regular standard bricks too, uh, but this particular detail, this shape, sheds the water better. This is. Um, a more recent uh, or a recent photo in uh, on the Philadelphia Main Line, <clears throat> in Paoli. Uh, this is, uh, is another estate, large estate, uh, repurposed as the uh, Main Line, Upper Main Line YMCA. Um, and I had uh, a camp and 
classes in here when I was younger. There's several pools and art studios in the building, uh, different activities. Um, the brick you can see on here, um, this is actually a French style architecture, uh, but the, the brick you see on the, uh, the corners, um, there's a pattern there. Uh, this is uh, uh, called a coin. Um, uh, this uh, had structural purposes originally, and in more recent years, uh, is purely architectural. Uh, it's an architectural detail. <clears throat> you can do this with stone also. This is our last slide of this lecture. This is uh, some uh, uh, brick walls, uh, quite a few of them uh, around Old Windsor. Um, Windsor is a, a town, it's actually where uh, London Heathrow Airport, is uh, right outside of Old Windsor. Uh, Windsor is very close, uh, quite a bit of air traffic, unfortunately. Uh, it's where um, Windsor Castle is, uh, Queen Elizabeth's home. She's a uh, her name is Elizabeth Windsor, and that's the castle of Windsor, from, uh, made more recently into a, uh, quite a large complex. Uh, this is Old Windsor, and brick walls around Old Windsor, and um, quite nice detailing uh, in this area for masonry and brick. <clears throat>